My experience as an educator over the last 15 years has taught me that the aptitude and enthusiasm for regional anesthesia varies amongst our trainees and colleagues. Some people are always going to be reluctant to learn advanced and potentially more risky techniques. And we have to respect that, but at the same time give them alternatives. And this brings me to my next point. It doesn't always have to be one or the other. I think it's most valuable to think about ESP and paravertebral blocks as two ends of a physical and philosophical spectrum. Because the imaging and needle approach is so similar for ESP and the parasagittal in-plane approach to paravertebral blocks, the motivated practitioner can graduate themselves from doing ESPs to paravertebral blocks. And while that is happening, more patients can benefit from regional anesthesia as a result. I don't personally believe that the ultrasound-guided paravertebral block is that difficult anymore, nor is it as risky, and I speak as someone who was never taught to do it. But this is exactly because I have now scanned the area so much in doing so many ESP blocks that I know that if I can get a good image, particularly of the pleura, and I can see my needle well, then I can put my needle tip safely into that paravertebral space. At the same time, and this is important, the reverse is also true. I can go into the procedure knowing that if for any reason I am unsure or having difficulty with guiding the needle to the paravertebral space, I can bail out, perform either an ESP or even an ITP block, and still provide the patient with much benefit. So as Bruce Lee would say, be water, my friend. So as I've said, I think it's valuable to think of ESP and paravertebral locks as just two ends of a spectrum. This is a typical parasatchel view through the tips of the transverse processes. And in an ESP block, we insert the needle just under the hyperechoic fascial line that separates the erector spinae muscle from the underlying intertransverse connective tissue complex. The paravertebral block, on the other hand, is performed by inserting the needle much deeper through that hyperechoic line that separates the dark fat-filled space just superficial to the pleura, which, let's face it, is not always clearly visible. In any needle tip placement, an injection between these two points into the intertransverse tissue complex, we would now call an intertransverse process or ITP block. Several other block names do come under this umbrella, of which the MTP described by Iwana Kostash was the first. But I do think in practice, there isn't much point in quibbling over these different names based on very fine anatomical details. Because a simplified model is useful for learning as long as it's accurate enough for practical purposes. And really, the only clinically important and relevant anatomical structures and landmarks are those that we can reliably and consistently identify on ultrasound. And these, in my experience, are the erector spinae muscle and fascia, the bony surfaces and shadows of the rib, transverse process, lamina, as well as the hyperechoic lines of the SCTL and the pleura. So any placement of the needle tip in any technique should be described in relation to these structures. When we first described the ESP block, we did simplistically describe it as an injection under erector spinae muscle, and we further said, just touch down on the bony transverse process for maximum safety. Our understanding of the anatomy at the time was so limited that initially we and others had thought that the thoracal lumbar fascia encasing the erector spinae muscle was the container that directed craniocaudal spread and thus injecting within it was important for producing this pattern and the clinical effect. We now know that this is only true if your primary target for analgesia is the dorsal rami of spinal nerves and the posterior torso in the spine. If you're interested in the ventral rami and blocking the anterolateral torso, however, then it's critical to inject deep to the fascial sheath of erector spinae muscle into that retro SCTL space. You don't want to see muscle expansion or spread occurring above any of the bright fascial layers under the muscle, no matter how beautifully it is flowing and opening up in a craniocaudal direction. If you see this, you must insert the needle deeper. You want to see the muscle and its deepest fascia lifting and oftentimes even a swirling in the deeper intertransverse tissues. Now you could call this an ITP or even an MTP block and I wouldn't quibble with it because I think the most important thing is to understand for your patient what you're trying to achieve, how to do it, and what you can do in that moment with your probe, your needle, and the image that you have. One technical and anatomical point for successful ESP blocks that hasn't been emphasized much to date but I think is critical is not just where you place the needle tip with regard to the anterior posterior axis but also the medial lateral axis. We now know that there are these two gaps that link the retro SCTL and paravertebral spaces 
And the medial slit, or what others call the costal transverse foramen, is the closest passageway connecting the ESP and retro SCTL space to the proximal paravertebral space, where the spinal nerve root emerges from the neural foramen. So we must pay attention to the exact parasagittal plane that we are imaging and needling, in terms of whether it is more medial or more lateral. So nowadays, I don't recommend necessarily trying to target the very tip of the transverse process. Because what often happens when you do that is that you can end up even more lateral in the plane of the rib transverse process articulation. Because this is where you tend to get a nice bright image of the bony surface of the proximal rib and the pleura, and perhaps even the SCTL. And it looks good. However, this is significantly more lateral. And as you can see from this intertransverse process view, it lowers the probability that you are going to get local anesthetic into that proximal area of the paravertebral space where the high value targets are, the dorsal root ganglion and the spinal nerve root. I think it makes more sense to ensure that we're imaging and advancing the needle in the parasagittal plane that is closer to the base of the transverse process rather than the tip, what some might also call a paralaminar plane. In practice, this means a plane where you still see the squared off shadow of the transverse process, but where the pleura and SCTL are barely visible, if at all. In this more medial parasagittal plane, any injection under erector spinae muscle is now closer to the medial slit or costal transverse foramen. And this increases the probability that we will get spread into the proximal paravertebral space rather than into the intercostal space. So, in summary, my recommendation is to always obtain and target this lower image highlighted in red and not the other one. I'm going to end with this slide, which summarizes some of my closing thoughts on when and why you should consider doing an ESP block rather than a paravertebral block. In my development as a clinician, I increasingly value flexibility and versatility as qualities. And I think that in this respect, the ESP and the related ITP blocks have opened up the scope of the benefits of regional anesthesia to so many more patients in so many more scenarios.